Okay, so uh, in this podcast, I'm going to talk uh, just very, very briefly about uh, the rise of Stalin, the, the rise of the Soviet Union uh, in the post uh, in, during World War I uh, and after World War I. So one of the most profound consequences of World War I was the, the Romanov dynasty uh, in, the, in Russia was overthrown and uh, the Vol Bolsheviks, uh, the communists, uh, took over uh, a small band of very, very dedicated uh, and very, very ruthless uh, politicians who built themselves as uh, followers of Karl Marx. Uh, they wanted to build up the working class in the Soviet Union. They wanted to build up the proletariat. Uh, they gained control over Russia. And the head of this revolution was Vladimir uh, Lenin. You're not going to be tested on that. Um, but I do want to point out one thing. When the Bolsheviks came into power, they were very, very weak. And they had to sign a treaty with the German government, which d didn't last because why didn't it last? Because Germany lost uh, World War I. But I just want to talk about this treaty for a second because it shows how, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? In some ways, changeable, maybe. Uh, how in flux, maybe that's another way to put it the borders between what became the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe were um, from the period of 1918, really up until the period that we're talking about. And it's because these borders were in flux. This is one of the drivers of history. This is one of the, uh, the engines of history during this period because Hitler wants to change the borders to suit his purposes and Stalin wants to change the borders to suit his purposes. And again, both sides want, uh, want Ukraine very much. This is very important to Stalin's plans and beginning in the 1930s, and it's very important to Hitler's plans beginning in the 1940s. So Ukraine plays a big role uh, in the history of this course. Uh, and of course, you know, there's fighting going on today in Ukraine. So what happens is, is that when the Bolsheviks, when the communists take power in the Soviet Union, they decide that they're going to make peace with Germany. They make a separate peace with Germany. OK, that may be confusing to some of you, but what I want you to know is this peace only lasts for less than a year because ultimately Germany is defeated, but it will have significant consequences. It's called the Treaty of brest litovsk um, uh, And you'll, you'll, you might be quizzed on it. This is something, if I devote a podcast to it, this is something that you should know about. And so what happens during this peace? Now, what Lenin, the, the head of the Soviet Union, the, the revolutionary who takes control in Moscow, he's a, he's a very pragmatic, practical guy. And one of the promises that he had made to the Russian people when his kind of crew and his, his, his small kind of cadre seized power and created the Soviet Union, he promised them peace um, because the war was not going well for Russia uh, during World War I. So this is one of his, the central pillars of, of his legitimacy and power. And um, so he feels like, look, I've got to make peace with Germany. Otherwise, I'll get overthrown because, you know, the Bolsheviks at this point were not the majority in the Soviet Union. They were just the most organized. They were just the most ruthless. So basically what happens is Lenin authorizes the signing of a peace with uh, Germany that is very, very unfavorable to the Soviet Union. OK, so in that peace. Uh, the Soviets, it, and it says it right here, if you're looking at a screen, they accept the independence of Finland right here, uh, Estonia, uh, Livonia, Cortland, Lithuania, uh, Belarus, and Ukraine. So this area here, what became the Soviet Union, for a very brief period, this area of the Western Soviet Union uh, became free of the Soviet Union. And what the Germans got out of it is, is they basically uh, uh, would control these areas. They were independent. The, so these countries were independent of the Soviet Union, but in effect, they come under the control of Germany. Okay. 
this is a significant part of the Soviet Union, but Stalin, who was a, I don't know, how would you put it? I guess, I don't know, is genius, evil genius, I don't know. He, he makes a gamble. He says, look, we're going to make a separate peace with Germany, uh, uh, separate from England and the U.S. and France. We're going to give up a lot of land to, to, to Germany. But what's, what Lenin was banking on is that Germany would lose the war. And you know what? He won his bet. He took this major bet. And ultimately, within the year, 1918, by November 1918, just about eight months later, Germany does surrender. And then all this land comes back uh, into the Soviet Union. Uh, it was a third of the population of the Soviet Union was given up in, in the Treaty of uh, brest uh, But then eight months later, the Soviet Union gets back this land. And uh, so, so Lenin won his kind of uh, gamble with the devil. He was able to make peace with Germany, but ultimately Germany loses the war and these lands come back into the Soviet Union. Um, and I, I point this out is, it, it, once again, we're gonna see what a bouncing ball it was for Ukraine. So here's Ukraine, suddenly they're, they're part of Russia, then it becomes quasi-independent, but really part of Germany, then back into the Soviet Union, then for a brief minute, it becomes li uh, truly an independent nation uh, in the post-war period. But by the middle of the 1920s, it's folded back into the Soviet Union. So Ukraine, Ukraine especially, um, its sovereignty is changing all the time. Uh, they could never, the Ukrainians could really never rest assured that uh, who they were, who, what flag flew over Ukraine? Would it, would it be a Ukrainian flag? Would it be a, a, the Soviet flag? Would it be the flag of Germany? Um, so Ukraine, Ukraine, because just because of its position in Europe, is a bouncing ball between more powerful nations. And again, let me stress, the significance of Ukraine is food. And you know what? We are really, really lucky most of us anyway, uh, in the United States, that food is something that we don't have to think about that much. Now, there is there is hunger in the United States, so let's not forget about that. But I would say just in general, uh, besides the disgraceful amounts of hunger in the U.S., most Americans don't have to think about food. They go to the grocery store and, and the food is there, the bread is there, It's on, you, can, you can pull it out. Um, um, so it's not something that's really at the forefront of most Americans' minds. But this is something, the, the Ukraine being such a bread basket, this is something that's absolutely essential to uh, Hitler and Stalin. And it's one of the reasons I'm making such a big deal about it uh, in this part of the course, uh, in addition, of course, Ukraine uh, is being fought over today. Now, it's not necessarily being fought over today because of food. Uh, Stalin, uh, Putin, uh, he argues that Ukraine is a fictitious country, that it never exists as an independent country, that Ukraine has always been part of Russia. A lot of Ukrainians speak Russian. Um, so the arguments today so, uh, aren't so much about food. But in the period that we're studying, food is front and central and, and other natural resources uh, to Stalin and to Hitler. And Thankfully, food is something that most Americans don't have to think about, but it was very, very much part of the geopolitical calculations of um, Hitler and Stalin during this period. So just to repeat, there was this treaty that was signed very briefly uh, at the end of World War I. Russia makes a separate peace with, um, with Germany, uh, where it gives away a uh, uh, almost a, a third of its arable land, uh, a, a good portion of its population, 55 million folks. It does that to make peace with Germany. Uh, and then uh, Lenin does that because it, he won't stay in power unless he makes his promise, he keeps his promise to the Russian people that he's gonna make peace with Germany. So he makes, he makes a calculated risk, a very calculated risk, and he wins. He, he's able, he, he gets to have his cake and eat it too which is kind of a food metaphor, right? Um, he makes peace with the Germans, but then about eight months later, Germany surrenders. 
uh, and Soviet Union uh, uh, recaptures the land that it uh, had given away to Germany, that had, it had surrendered to Germany uh, in this treaty. Uh, again, uh, the, the key uh, areas of the Soviet Union that, that were surrendered to Germany were Ukraine, the, the Baltic states, Lithuania, uh, Estonia, Finland, um, and um, they come back into the Soviet Union for a very brief period after World War I, you, Ukraine uh, becomes truly an independent country. But by 1922, uh, the Soviet Union has recaptured it and Ukraine becomes subsumed into the Soviet Union. And, you know, I have to say, when I was in college, I didn't even know what Ukraine was. It was nothing that I ever thought about. Because the Soviet Union, and ultimately the Soviet Union is, is 15 separate republics, including Ukraine. You know, you never, when I was in college, unless you were a Soviet specialist, you never thought of Ukraine. You just thought of the Soviet Union. But with the collapse of the Soviet Union in the 1980s, sudden, suddenly all these nationalities that you never thought about, at least when I was a kid, suddenly they become independent states in the, in the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, so, yeah, so, so for me, like I say, when I was in college, Ukraine it meant nothing to me. Um, uh, I just didn't think of it. I, I just thought of the Soviet Union as, as a whole, and I didn't think of the multiple nationalities that the Soviet Union was made up of. So again, kind of the big take home point of this, this particular podcast is that Ukraine is, is a bouncing ball. Uh, Germany always wanted it. Uh, in World War I, they, they captured it for about eight months, but then they lose it after their defeat. The Russians want uh, Ukraine as well. What's the key thing? Food, agriculture, wheat. Uh, that's what Ukraine has. That's a precious natural resource it has. So there's a deeper, deeper context to the fight over Ukraine in the 1930s, in the 1940s. It just doesn't come from nowhere. Uh, in other words, uh, geopolitical strategists in Berlin and Moscow had had their eye on Ukraine and to a lesser extent, the Baltic states and Finland uh, uh, for at least until at, at least beginning of World War One and probably far uh, before that.